lot of people, like 400, 500 people were there. Um, ben Cresno will now talk something, uh, say something about the X-ray scanner he built. And so we start again with radiation this morning. Um, the rest of the talks are more electrical engineering and um, some, some hardware. So uh, welcome back here and the stage is yours. Good morning. My name is Ben Krasnow and I am excited to be here. This is my first uh, hacker conference, so I'm very thankful for Sebastian to uh, invite me out here and I think it's been a really good conference. And I'm looking forward to it growing year after year. I really want a, uh, an open source hardware hacking conference. I think that sounds really good. So today I, uh, I want to talk about imaging things with x-rays and um, you know, I've kind of calibrated myself to making YouTube videos, which are only five or 10 minutes. And so when I heard I had to fill an hour, I was like, oh my God, that's five or 10 topics at YouTube speed. So I chose my X-ray backscatter imager, which is something that I've recently completed. And I'll also talk about X-ray CT scanners, which I also built, and also Raman spectroscopy. <laughs> so it's kind of a heavily loaded thing. We'll see how far uh, we get. I, I wanna make sure there's time for questions too. So. Um, I, I, you know, if we, if we get kind of through two of the topics and there's, there's only time for questions left, maybe we'll just jump to it and we can talk about the Raman spectroscopy later. So anyway, so let's get started. Um, I've got a picture up there. I don't know, how many of you guys have seen the video of the uh, backscatter detector? Okay. So you, you've seen the chicken. This is my friend, the chicken here, and I, it's a simulating a person wearing a sweater. And um, if you've gone through an airport in the US recently, you might have encountered one of these backscatter imaging devices which are uh, designed to make us safer, and, and they're supposed, supposed to find to metal objects that are hidden on your body uh, through your clothing, to detect them through clothing. So to simulate that, I just put an Allen key in front of this chicken here, and then scanned it with the backscatter imager, and you can see the image of the, uh, the chicken's body with the Allen key sitting here. So I build stuff like this just sort of for fun. Um, for about seven or eight years, I ran my own business out of my home shop. And my business was to build MRI-compatible equipment for cognitive researchers. So people that do brain research using MRI machines uh, have to have a way for the human subjects to interact with the computer program while the subject is in the scanner. So I built things like computer keyboards, computer mice, eye trackers, uh, stimulatory devices, all meant to go inside MRI scanners, uh, where the magnetic field is typically three Tesla. And there's also uh, time gradients and um, spatial gradients that are difficult to deal with, as well as RF pulses. So it's a very hostile environment for electrical engineering. I actually graduated with a mechanical engineering degree, but have done more electrical engineering just because um, I, I kind of like circuits a little bit more. I, I guess I, when I started into the mechanical engineering program, I wanted to you know, do things like build race car parts or something. And then I found out that actually if you become a mechanical engineer, you do things like design shift knobs and little screws and stuff that's a little bit too focused. So I, I started my own business so that I could do kind of more kinds of engineering. These days I work at Valve Software. Uh, Valve recently started a hardware lab and it was a really interesting opportunity for me because I didn't have to design like screws and shift knobs and stuff. We can actually do entire product design. Uh, it's a very small team at Valve, and uh, Valve recently announced a Steam box, a uh, console that's going to compete with, with um, the Xbox and PlayStation. So it's some exciting stuff going on there. Um, anyway, what I was getting at with the home shop is that I was able to buy equipment for my home business and then also use it for personal stuff. So I have a CNC milling machine, a 12 by 36 lathe, a TIG welder, two electronics benches, a table saw, a fair bit of equipment, um, at my disposal, which is quite handy. So I, I, uh, I'm always interested in unusual imaging techniques. I built a scanning electron microscope in 2011 and showed that at Maker Faire for the past two years. And I thought it was interesting to image things with electrons, so why not image things with x-rays? That's also an interesting mode. Um, the traditional way to take an x-ray of something is to get your x-ray source, which is an x-ray tube, and shine, it, shine the x-rays through an object so that they create a shadow on the detector. So you should think about x-rays as just like another kind of light. It behaves very much like light being reflected and absorbed and transmitted through objects. It's just that x-rays penetrate objects much more easily than visible light. So things like you know metal, 
aluminum especially, are very transparent to x-rays, amazingly so. Um, who's had a chest x-ray here? I've actually never had one. Yeah, they're not too popular these days. Um, it, they involve fairly high doses of x-rays because the, the x-rays have to penetrate all the way through the body. And so, uh, unless it's sort of medically warranted, I, I guess they're kind of avoided these days. Um, but the, the classic setup is here where you have the x-ray source beaming at you and then the x-rays pass through the body and hit the detector. And the detector in modern uh, setups is usually a diode array with a phosphor screen or a phosphor uh, element coupled to the diodes. So the x-rays go through the object and then hit the detector where they're recorded pixel by pixel. The problem with this is that you need a detector that's as big as the thing that you want to image. Um, we don't have a, such a thing as an x-ray lens. So for an optical camera, you would just use a piece of glass to focus the light photons down onto your film. But you can't do that with x-rays because we don't have a lens that will actually work with x-ray photons. So the only choice that we have is to make a shadow a shadow picture of, of whatever it is you want to image. So this is a, a diagram showing the x-ray source. The top of the, of the apex here is the source. And this is showing two different sizes of x-ray source. Um, this is the ideal case where the source is a point, And this is the realistic case where the source actually has some size to it. And if you're imaging something like this little object called O in the, in the uh, circle here, the, in the real world case, there's this soft edge, it's called a penumbra, which is a shadow, a shadowed region. So instead of getting a nice sharp image here, you get a fuzzy image because of the size of the detector. You can see, oops, you can see the uh, ray trace there. Um, most x-ray tubes are set up to minimize the spot size as much as possible, but then that focuses the power down to a very small area, which, which is also a problem. So here's a picture of an x-ray tube I bought off eBay. This was about $80 or something like that. And it's internally it's set up like this, where you have a coil on one side and an anode on the other. And this diagram shows a water-cooled coil where it's got cooling water coming in to cool down the anode. Some coils, this coil here is not cooled, it's, well, it's air-cooled. How many of you are familiar with high voltage and amps, watts, ohms. Good. <laughs> so so x-ray tubes consume um, a surprising amount of high power at high voltage. So this, this tube that I bought off eBay is 50 kilovolts at one milliamp, which is 50 watts <clears throat> at high voltage, which is actually a fairly unusual power supply to come by. I have scoured eBay for a long time and finding a 50 watt high voltage power supply is actually surprisingly difficult. So I, I lucked out and found a tube that was coupled already to a power supply that was meant for circuit board analysis and used the whole setup. It also came with a filament supply that's about three volts at two amps. And the way this works is by heating up the filament and causing electrons to boil off the filament. This is called thermionic emission. And the high voltage potential, this 50 kilovolts between the coil and the anode are, is what causes the electrons to move. So by heating up the filament, we get the electrons freed from the metal, and then the high voltage potential causes the electrons to accelerate towards the anode. When they strike the anode, the x-rays are actually created by the slowing of the electrons. This is the Bremsstrahlung. So the radiation that you get is dependent on the voltage. So a higher voltage will recreate a higher energy x-ray. You might have heard about you know, 50 kilovolt x-rays or 100 kilovolt x-rays. That describes the wavelength or the energy in those uh, x-ray photons. So if you put 50 kilovolts across here and start creating x-rays, the maximum energy you can ever get is 50 kilovolts. You'll actually get most of your uh, x-rays out at 20 or 30 kilovolts, and then there's kind of a, a normal-ish looking distribution that shows you get all the way up to 50 kilovolts, but not higher. There's another method that this creates x-rays by that's uh, d d dependent on the material of the anode. And typically, tungsten is used because uh, it gives a favorable uh, characteristic X-ray spectra. The uh, power that you put into the tube in, in milliamps will determine the quantity of X-rays. So you've sort of got the, the energy of the X-rays, which is analogous to the color of the light. If you think of X-rays as a ton of light, the, the kilovolt rating is just the, the color of it. And the, uh, the amount of power that's coming, or the amount of current that's going through the coil determines the intensity. 
So traditional X-ray imaging uh, at airports, typically used for baggage scanners, are meant to be lower cost than medical devices, and so they typically use a two-dimensional sca uh, scanner sensor array. So as the baggage uh, goes through the scanner, there's a two-dimensional sensor and a fan beam of, of X-rays. So it uses the conveyor belt to actually move the baggage past the sensor, and it just records the data as the baggage goes through. Um, here's a typical image that um, you might get out of one of these baggage scanners. Oh, also, uh, check out Mike's Electric stuff, who did a really good teardown of an uh, airport baggage scanner on YouTube. He actually had to reverse engineer it and come up with the password to get into the uh, operator settings. It was quite a good video series. Um, the, the colors in these, in these images actually indicate something about the atomic number of all the materials in there. So low atomic number uh, materials show up as orange, and green shows up as, or green materials are mid-range and blue are high range. So you can see in this image, he's got some bottles of, of soda in here, which are orange. And then the green stuff is the glass and the camera lens here. And then the blue is all the metal parts. I should add, if any of you have any questions, I don't mind being interrupted, especially with a group this size. I'd be more than happy to stop and answer something. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Ah, glad you brought that up. The, um, the current that's going through the, the chain from the filament to the anode, this guy, determines the quantity. The amount of current going through the filament determines the relationship between the applied voltage and the current that this thing will draw. So, um, and it's also dependent on the distance between the filament and the anode. Um, for a given tube geometry, which you can't change once the tube is built, what you typically do is put a set voltage on it and then crank up the filament current until you achieve the emission that you want. And so I actually, in one of my videos I showed where I had a circuit that, um, that I had to reverse engineer to figure out how it works. And it's basically a, um, a PI control loop that figures out what power to put through the filament in order to achieve a certain emission current. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, these are the kind of sensors that are used in the baggage sensor, in the baggage scanners. What we have here is a, an array of diodes, and inside it there are uh, scintillators, which is some sort of a material that produces light when x-rays hit it. So it's true that, you know, you've probably heard you can expose film by shining x-rays on it, and that's certainly true, but it's not a very efficient method, and it really works with photodiodes as well. A better thing to do is to put a phosphor material on the photodiode and then let the x-rays create visible photons through the phosphor and then record the light from those. So in this case, this is only about, you know, 10 diodes or something in here, and you typically have a whole bank of these things in one of those typical airport baggage scanners. Uh, the other neat trick they do is put the diodes side by side and then shield one set of diodes with something like um, a piece of metal. I'm not sure what it is, perhaps aluminum. And so the high energy x-rays will go right through the aluminum, no problem, but the uh, or sorry, the other way, the, the high energy x-rays will penetrate the metal and the low x-rays will not. So by having two diodes right next to each other, you can get a sense of what uh, strength of x-rays is coming from your uh, image source. So as the backpack goes over it, you'll get high energy x-rays penetrating through the metal objects, but not low energy x-rays. I think at about 150 kilovolts, the amount of absorption in materials is almost purely density related. So it, it doesn't really care what atomic number it is, it's only the density. Whereas lower energy x-rays of about 75 kilovolts are um, sensitive to the atomic number of the material that they're interacting with. So here we go. So here's one of these horrible scanners that the US loves so much. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but in the US you pretty much have to walk through one of these or you have a chance of walking through them when it's a random sample kind of thing if you fly domestically pretty much anywhere in the US. We also have millimeter wave scanners, um, but these are kind of the preferred method that I've seen most often. I fly pretty often, and so I'm quite familiar with these devices. Um, I think if the government had its way, it would probably just x-ray everybody, <laughs> because that's really the, the most effective way to, fit, to see what you have on you. The problem with these backscatter scanners, as I'll show you later, is that they're quite easily to bypass. I mean, there's, I'll, I'll show you the details later, but. Doing a full scan body x-ray is really the only way to find out what you're actually trying to conceal. 
Um, unfortunately, that's not possible because to get enough x-rays through you would involve quite a high dose of x-rays and um, eventually the healthcare costs would mount up and that would be an even bigger problem. Uh, so as I mentioned, we don't have x-ray lenses, which is, is pretty, pretty much too bad. If we had an x-ray lens, we could build all kinds of interesting imaging devices that do a much better job of figuring out what we want to, um, to see in an object. But since we don't have a, a lens, we have to uh, work with another method. So this is how the backscatter imagers work. There's a, a slotted disk of sorts and an x-ray tube behind it. And what happens is the slotted disk rotates and causes one tiny little shaft of x-rays to come out and hit the object. And so this tiny shaft of x-rays is scanned across the object in a raster fashion. So there's actually two slotted disks, one for vertical and one for horizontal. And the detector is essentially a one pixel camera that can absorb x-rays all over its surface. So as this thing scans along, the x-rays come out in a very thin beam and hit the object, and then the return is gathered by this huge detector, which is uh, very large. In the case of those airport scanners, the detector is um, about a square meter in, in area, maybe even more, and they're kind of stacked up in the detector uh, frame there. I got a lot of my information on building this thing from a patent, and I've uh, noted the patent number here. Um, there was all kinds of really great details in there, so I encourage you all to check patents for getting information on all kinds of, yeah. Yeah, that one. Ah, so these, these are, um, yeah, the question was, um, how, how would you use this sort of a sensor without a lens to concentrate the x-rays on the sensor? Um, these only work with the shadow method. So you actually need enough of these to create a ring that goes all the way around the whole baggage scanner. And then there's like a fan beam of x-rays that go through the baggage. And then you have this entire array covered with diodes. Yeah. Here's kind of an overview shot from the uh, patent. The 17 is the actual detector, and 14 and 15 are the chopper wheels that create this very fine beam of x-rays that comes out and hits the subject. So think of it uh, just like using like, light from a flashlight. Um, have you ever seen like long exposure photography where you just, in a very dark room, you can open your camera's shutter and then just use a flashlight in the dark room to paint certain objects with light? It's a pretty cool technique, and, and this actually works the same way. So from the x-ray's point of view, the subject is completely dark, except for this one little spot that's illuminated by the x-rays. But again, we have a problem, because we, since we don't have an x-ray lens, we need some way of concentrating those x-rays into a, a fine beam. And there's really no easy way to do this, except putting a little aperture far away from the x-ray source. So, you know, the sun is a really good, like, um, source of light at infinity. So when a plane flies overhead, the shadow on the ground is very close to the size of the plane itself because the light rays are, are almost parallel. And we, ideally, we want something similar for, the, the, for this X-ray scanner because we want the beam to come out of this device here and stay straight and parallel and hit one very small region. If the beam was like a fan of X-rays that shot out of here and then, you know, illuminated this whole guy's chest right here, that wouldn't be any, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to form an image out of that. So the trick is to have a, an aperture that's far away from your x-ray tube, but the aperture has to move in x and y because we need to be able to scan this beam across the subject. So here's a little SolidWorks um, drawing of the thing that I built. And the way that we make an aperture here is to put a slot in this disk. And where the slot exits the disk is uh, where the aperture is. So the x-rays are shown by this green cone here. The tube produces about a 25 degree cone. And the aperture is about one millimeter square at the edge of this disk here. I'm so used to working in SolidWorks, I was almost trying to like middle click to rotate this around for you, but it's just an image. I measured this out so that the uh, beam coming out of the, the one millimeter aperture has about 0.6 degrees uh, divergence. So that'll make about a five millimeter 
spot on a target that's about half a meter away from the scanner. Uh, the patent has all kinds of great information about this, and you can actually figure out what the resolution of those airport scanners is just by reading the patent. Um, I'm kind of surprised that knowing our government that they hadn't restricted more of that information, but it's actually all there in the patent, and you can figure out the resolution of those devices quite easily. Here's a top view of it. Um, you can see here that I, I chose to cut four slots in this wheel here. So what happens is the wheel spins around, and that's how it gives the slot the X dimension, the control over the X dimension. And in this case, I could have put eight slots um, and had more, um, more scan lines per revolution. So for every, every slot that goes through the X-ray cone, I get one scan across the field of view. Does that make sense? We like basically got a scanner here, and as it spins around, oops, it's, uh, that was bad. As it spins around, um, the X-ray spot travels in the X dimension across the scene. So if I put eight slots in this wheel here, as it spins around, I would get more spots traveling across. Um, in this case, I was planning on using an X-ray tube that has a total cone of about 90 degrees. So as the wheel spins around, I'd want to be able to have only four slots in it so that I didn't get multiple slots or multiple scans per line. So we're basically building a raster scanner here and, and choosing what field of view angularly it has in the space. So here's a picture of the thing. Um, it's mostly built out of 6061 aluminum. And uh, here's the x-ray tube here. These are all custom milled parts. Uh, I've got some pictures of the machining later on. This, this project actually involved quite a lot of machining. It turned out to be a very um, machining heavy project. The planning of this was a little less than I expected, but the machining of it was quite a bit more than I expected. And so one problem, which I'll talk about later, is that the accuracy of this disk has to be extremely high. So the scan size, the spot on the edge of this disk is only one millimeter square. So if this disk wobbles up and down, if the edge of this disk wobbles up and down by just one millimeter, uh, no x-rays will come out of this thing because the slot won't be straight, won't be parallel to the, um, to the x-ray cone coming out of the x-ray tube. So this involved a lot of high precision machining and bearings and um, a whole lot of uh, adjustment. This is a little piece of lead that I put on here to restrict the x-rays to a very thin beam. And then the beam is chopped up by the, the wheel here. Is that making sense? Basically, basically all we've built here is a, a very complicated, very high precision x-ray beam scanner. That is uh, 1018 steel. And the rest of it's aluminum. Yeah, so it's a good point. The reason that the wheel isn't aluminum as well, since alum machining aluminum is a whole lot more fun than machining steel, um, the x-rays shoot through aluminum like, like nothing. So you have to build the chopper wheel out of steel or another dense material, depleted uranium, or whatever's convenient. Yeah, gold would be good. Um, to spin this thing around, I just got an induction motor here and used an O-ring for the belt. And this thing spins at about 330 RPM, somewhere about there. So here's a, a shot of the bearing structure inside the uh, cup. So I have this aluminum cup here, and then there's a taper bearing, just like the bearing on your car. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. So. Um, no, the, the x-ray tube has a uh, slanted surface in there, and um, the electrons typically impinge on the surface at about oh, 70 or 80 degrees or something like that, and there will be a heel effect so that the beam uh, going towards the sloping away side will be slightly higher or something like that. For the most part, it's fairly uniform. Um, I've, you'll see in the CT sc uh, slides that I put up later that the beam is uniform to your eye, even though if you measure it, it's not quite uniform. Um, yeah, so I got the taper bearing there. Uh, to sense where this thing actually is, I just put a simple potentiometer for the y-axis and just screwed it on there. And for the wheel, I put an opto sensor and drilled holes in the wheel. So making use of my CNC machine, I was able to drill all the reference holes for this and then drill holes at exactly 90 degree spacing that were in phase with the slot spacing. So as the wheel spins around, um, it trips these little optical sensors. 
To take a look at the image that this thing's actually going to produce for us, I used an analog oscilloscope, Tektronix 2246, and the x-axis on the oscilloscope is a sweep that is triggered by that optical sensor on the disk. So as the disk spins around, it trips the optical sensor, and when that trips, the oscilloscope sweeps. And it's set up so that the sweep on the oscilloscope will take about the same amount of time that it takes for the disk to make uh, one pass through the X-ray beam. So I basically captured the angular field that this thing is going to scan with the horizontal field on the oscilloscope. And the Y-axis is just direct from the potentiometer. The Z-axis on an analog oscilloscope uh, determines how bright the screen is. And this is how we're actually going to form the image. So the z-axis is gathered from the backscatter sensor, which I'll, I'll talk about now. How much time have we got? We're doing pretty good. Um, here's another picture from the patent. Um, you, so the challenge here is that we have um, a backscatter, a, a sort of a bunch of backscatter x-rays coming off the subject, and they're coming off in all directions. So if you took a flashlight in a dark room and just aimed it at a, at a subject, a person or whatever, the light that gets reflected off that person just goes in all different directions. I mean, it's, it scatters, it's backscatter. So you need a, a really big area detector to catch as much as possible to make an efficient imaging system. So in the scanner patent, they actually spec'd about four to eight of these big boxes that are just lined up, so basically making as much area as possible facing you. And the reason they want to do this is to lower the amount of x-rays required to make the image. So one, you could just crank up the beam and just blast the person with more and more x-rays. That would produce more backscatter. But if you're mandated to make this you know, a very low exposure device, the other option is just to add more and more sensors so that you can use a lower beam to probe the subject. So I ended up <clears throat> building one of these. Here's my version of it. This is uh, a bunch of coroplast, which is a corrugated plastic material. It's very light, tight. Um, it's probably transparent in the mid to far infrared, but above that, it's actually very, very opaque. It's good enough for film work. And next to it, I have uh, a Mighty Ohm Geiger counter, which I was using to uh, keep me safe through all these experiments. Um, over here is the power supply for the X-ray tube itself. So a fairly compact unit. I mean, that's 50 watts at 50 kV. Um, but again, they're, they're actually very difficult to find on eBay. Here's what the inside of that box looks like. I've got some aluminum foil just to reflect the light that comes off of this screen. The screen is a phosphor. I believe I used a gadolinium uh, erbium doped phosphor. And this will glow green when x-rays hit it. So you basically got this black box with a screen on it and then a bunch of reflectors in there. And then a very sensitive photo detector, which I'll show in a minute. And that's how we actually detect the backscatter coming off of the subject. Um, oh, here's a list of phosphors that we can put in there just for posterity. So I guess the one that I was using was, um, it was very likely gadolinium uh, doped with terbium, maybe, P43. Uh, the only point to note here is that you, you have to worry about the decay time of the phosphor. So if you've got your x-ray beam scanning along, and you've got your big box with your phosphor and your optical detector, you really want the, de the detector to only show light from the x-rays that are hitting it at that exact instant in time. Because we're scanning this thing along, we want to make sure that the uh, light that we get out of there is up to date. If you have a phosphor that uh, keeps a, a long resonance or has a long persistence, then it's just going to glow green and just kind of stay green for a while. But meanwhile, the x-ray beam has moved along. So the effect of having a long decay phosphor would mean that our image is um, horizontally degraded. It would be more streaky and kind of low-pass filtered. The patent mentioned a couple of preferable phosphors, which I, I couldn't find, so I ended up just using P43, and it actually worked out OK. Uh, the very sensitive optical detector I used is called a photomultiplier tube. Are, are you guys mostly familiar with PMTs? A couple, yeah. It's basically a vacuum tube that is uh, super, super sensitive to light. I mean, it's basically the most sensitive optical detector that we have. Even now, it's, it's more sensitive than diodes, more sensitive than anything, as far as I know. The gain on these things is typically 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8. So they're quite efficient devices. Here's a little circuit diagram for it. In my case, I used a very simple setup. All I did was just put a resistor on the output and biased it so that the cathode was at negative 1,500 volts, I think. 
So the pulse is actually a negative voltage signal. So when the tube's just idling, it's in total darkness, you get no voltage out, it's zero in theory. And then when you apply a very, very small amount of light, you get a negative voltage. Okay, so let's take a look at some images here. So here's the chicken with the Allen key. Here's a bottle of isopropanol. You can see just barely that the bottom of the bottle in this region is slightly brighter than the rest of the bottle, and that's because the isopropanol itself has a backscatter signature. Uh, the bottle is probably high-density polyethylene or something like that, and we get a good backscatter signal from that, um, but the isopropanol adds a little bit to it. It's sitting on this metal can, which is, I think it's probably steel. I actually should, should have checked a little bit more carefully. I think, I think it is steel. Here's a piece of acrylic with a hole cut in it. So you can see the hole is pretty easy to see in the image, but these smaller holes, there are about you know, three or four millimeter holes here and here, uh, you can't see in here because the resolution is not quite good enough. Uh, in this image, the backscatter detector is right here, and the scanner is over here. Here's three metal rods, or sorry, one metal rod and two plastic rods, and what's interesting to notice, ah, sorry about that, What's interesting to notice is that uh, this image is mirrored. So the, the x-ray image at the top here is left to right, and the bottom image is right to left. So this metal rod right here corresponds to this. So there's actually almost no image at all from the aluminum. So for example, if you were to have a thin piece of aluminum going through one of these scanners, it most likely would not be detected very well. Um, this is a, about a 25 millimeter square piece of Delrin and this is a 50 millimeter round piece of Delrin. So you can see that the signal from the 25, or from the 50 millimeter round piece is huge compared to the 25 millimeter square piece. Here's an acrylic tube, and you can see sort of the parallax problem where if you're not looking down the tube uh, straight on, you'll kind of see its shadow. Uh, as I mentioned, this, this project basically was a, almost a straight up machining and um, assembly project with very high precision necessary. Um, I, I got to uh, test my machine skills very well on this project. And here's what my bench looks like kind of in most cases. All right, how much time do we have? I think we have enough time to talk about um, the computed tomography, since this is, this is something I've been working on in very recent days and I haven't made a video on yet, so this will um, be pretty quick. Um, since I had the, uh, the x-ray thing set up with all these you know, phosphor screens and image intensifiers and all that sort of stuff, I figured doing uh, computed tomography would be good too. So x-ray CT is a way of imaging things in 3D uh, inside an object. So if you've ever seen like a slice of, of, of somebody's torso like this, that's sort of an X-ray CT scan. And uh, the computed tomography just means um, a, a slice, and you calculate what the slice is based on the um, X-rays that go through the subject. So commercial CT scanners actually scan you in a helix. So you'll typically be on a bed that's rolling through the scanner, and the scanner is constantly spinning around you, so it creates a true helix. Uh, again, they do this to save on the detector array. So if you do it with this helix scan, you can get by with just a one-dimensional scanner or one-dimensional detector array. And what you do is you project your, your fan beam of x-rays out, and uh, your, your detector there is constantly getting new data as it goes through the helix. And I'll show you how to process the data later. Although this is kind of difficult because now you have to coordinate axial movement as well as rotational movement, and uh, your data is going to require um, a little bit more reconstruction. So there is actually an easier way called uh, cone beam CT. So instead of doing a fan beam like shown on the left here with a one-dimensional detector, you can use a cone beam that basically just comes out of a standard x-ray tube onto a two-dimensional detector. In this case, you get a nice image out of this uh, 2D detector that's much easier to process. So here's my setup. In this case, I'm CTing a cardboard box, but later you'll see it's actually a chicken. And uh, here's the detector screen. This is that same green uh, gadolinium terbium doped screen or whatever it is. And here's my x-ray tube here. So the idea is that this box, which is on an aluminum turntable, 
can spin around like this. And what we're going to do is take a picture of the screen uh, every eight degrees. So X-ray on, shoot through the target. You get an image on the screen, take a picture, rotate it eight degrees, X-ray on, take a picture, and you'll end up with a whole bunch of pictures of the subject in different rotations. Um, this is about what the screen looks like almost to the naked eye. This is probably about a 30 second exposure on my camera. And so in a really dark room with your eyes dark adapted, uh, you can fire up the x-ray tube and this is about what it looks like. You can kind of see the edge of the chicken right here. I, I froze it, you know, to keep it from rotting. And, um, and this is the, uh, the image that's on the screen. So in Photoshop, I just applied a scaling uh, perspective correction to it so that it would come out square. So here's what the collected data looks like. This is 45 images, so every eight degrees I took a shot, and you can clearly see that the bones absorb more x-rays than the fleshy parts. In this, this is a reverse image, so the bones are actually doing more absorbing, but in this image I reversed it so the bones are shown in, brighter, in a, in a brighter uh, color. My camera automatically takes a dark frame. You might have seen this on some, uh, some cameras. If you do like a really long exposure, I was doing 30 second exposures, the camera will automatically stop after the uh, exposure and then take another exposure with the shutter shut. So it actually took a minute for each acquisition and I needed 45 acquisitions, so it was 45 minutes worth of scanning just to get this data set that you see here. And what can you do with the data set? After processing, you can end up with the entire 3D representation of the bird plus its innards. So uh, this is done through a technique called back projection, which I'll show. And um, not only do you get the surface of the image, of the object that you're studying, you also get the internal structure. Uh, but one problem I've been having is that the geometry that I use in the computer model has to be really, really exactly matched with reality or you end up with this kind of mush problem. So the reason that we don't have any definition for the bones or anything inside the uh, bird is because there's a very slight mismatch in the geometry that the model is using. So we're trying to reconstruct the image, but it's not possible because uh, the, you know, the sizing doesn't match up. So it's basically projecting the parts of the, of the bird into the wrong spots and you just end up with this mush. Or maybe it really looks like that on the inside, who knows? <laughs> This is kind of what back, back projection looks like in 2D. So let's say we had an object like this that had dark circles and, and a white circle in it. If we took uh, an image of it from this angle and looked straight through the object, you would end up with a hot spot here and two dark spots from the two dark spots and the, and the hot spot here. So this is not a very good representation, but it's one step along the way. If we add to it, other views and compound the views together, we end up with a back projected image. So it's essentially sort of extruding the two dimensional images into 3D space. Does that make sense? This is a filtered back projection technique. Uh, and I think, I, I think I'll hold it there, yeah? Oh, okay. Is questions until 11? Oh, good, okay, we can fit it all in then, excellent. Yeah, so um, I guess maybe I'll take questions now for the x-ray stuff, because then I think I have enough time to talk about this Raman spectroscopy, which will also be a pretty quick look, just um, to get people familiar. Yeah. Oh. Uh, what's the name of the software that does the filtered back projection? <clears throat> I was pretty lucky to find a... Um, a, uh, a script that someone wrote for MATLAB, which I run in Octave on my computer. And I, I'm not really sure, I, it's not a commercial piece of software, it's not even an open source package, it's just some script a guy wrote and posted to, um, to a, uh, an exchange. Hi, um, in the images, uh, the scanned images, there, I noticed there was a lot of... Uh, uh, oh, the, uh, the backscatter? Yeah. You had a lot of variation in the intensity or something. Yeah. Uh, is that that the beam isn't uh, the same? Yeah, exactly. Constant, and so, or is it something else in the detector? No, it's, it's definitely a scanning problem. And so um, as with a lot of projects, you know, these things get kind of rushed at the end. And so originally I was planning on building like a worm gear or a large um, eccentric cam 
to drive this thing up and down. So that you've got the thing spinning in the x direction, and then you want it to kind of slowly pivot up and down to catch the y direction. Well, I ran out of time making worm gears and all that kind of stuff, so what I do is actually just reach in with my hand and just kind of tip it really slowly with my hand. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason that there's a little bit of variation in the scan density in the y direction is because, um, you know, sometimes I was going a little bit faster than other times, and so. <laughs> also wonder, um, you have some pictures of acrylic, and they are much brighter than you showed the uh, aluminum to be. Yeah, that's definitely true, uh, absolutely. So aluminum is, um, what, atomic number seven or eight or something? And um, the acrylic is, uh, polytetramethacrylate, polymethylmethacrylate, which is a much bigger molecule with lots of carbons and hydrogens packed in there. So you would get a much higher backscatter signal because of the um, higher atomic number, actually, because it's the carbon that's doing it. Um, I have one question. You said that it was um, easy to um, surpass those uh, <clears throat> airport scanners. Can you tell, say some more about that? Surpass the uh, what? Uh, the uh, airport scanners, the full body scanners. Oh, um, yeah, I'd probably get into too much trouble telling exactly how to bypass those things. But one of the problems is that with the backscatter x-ray, it's only looking at the surface of your body. So, for example, if you were to put something in a plastic container and put it in your cheek, like in your mouth, and close your mouth, there's no way that a scanner is going to detect that, not very well at least, probably not at all. Um, some people were freaking out about these scanners because if you look closely at the images um, of, of like the commercial backscatter images that the TSA has released, you can actually see the shin bones in the person getting scanned. And so someone said, oh, this, this proves that it's transmissive x-ray stuff. I mean, you can see the person's bones right through their skin. But um, the trick is that there's an interaction layer that this thing deals with. And so it shoots the x-rays at you and they penetrate, you know, maybe a few millimeters or a centimeter. And if they hit bone, they'll be uh, absorbed much more readily than if they continue hitting water and flesh. So it's true that you can actually see bones that are really close to the surface, but more than a few millimeters or a centimeter in, uh, it's, it's totally lost. So for example, if you implanted something metal in you, that would be detected by a metal detector, but not the backscatter detector. Um, a comment from me on that. There was a uh, media uh, in, in, in German TV uh, where one were hitting uh, things between a layer of meat he attached to his body, so it was not visible in the scanner, so. Yeah, they're pretty, I mean, it's yeah, kind of a typical, like, you know, American government contractor type thing where they have to have, like, this image of security. So they get a contractor that builds some expensive piece of equipment that doesn't work very well, and we buy a lot of them, and so, you know, it's... <laughs> yeah, hello. Uh, have you... Here. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you measured uh, the difference of X-ray uh, exposition between the two techniques you used, uh, the backscatter and the CT scanner? Yeah, definitely. So CT scanning is something that's super X-ray intensive, even for medical imaging. Um, a bio nerd mentioned that the CT scans are 10 millisievert, maybe. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, 15 to 25 millisievert for one CT scan. So as far as I know, they really reserve those for like really medically necessary things because that's, that's a fairly high dose. Um, the backscatter is supposed to be about 10 micro rem. I'm not sure how that, actually you probably know a whole lot more about me than, than the, the conversion from the micro rems to the sieverts and all that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have to Google that. That's the last thing. So. <laughs> I, so, yeah, they, they claim that um, you know, going through one of those backscatter detectors actually involves less radiation than being on a plane for a few hours because you're so much higher in the atmosphere, you'll actually get a higher radiation dose just being above the clouds for a couple hours. And I'm, I, I'm almost inclined to believe them. I, I don't think they're actually lying about that. The trick is that uh, the, the, you know, the, the aperture of that thing is so small, it's just one square millimeter that this thing is scanning across. So the beam only hits you for 
of the pixel time is somewhere on the order of you know, a couple milliseconds. So each part of your body is only exposed for a couple milliseconds. So it's actually a very efficient way to image something, which is you know, how they got away with this. If it involved you know, CT scanning every airline passenger, I mean, that would just be out of control. Okay, thank you. And uh, another question. Did you eat the chicken? <laughs> no, it's still in my freezer. Hi, um, yeah, I have a question. Um, nowadays, you also hear a lot about uh, terahertz um, detectors in airports. So how, how would you compare? Do you know? Um, you know, the backscatter, I think, is a slightly higher resolution. Those terahertz scanners are a little bit chunkier in terms of spatial resolution. I don't know about threat detection. I mean, it's, it's all part of the security theater where it's kind of like, you know, sure, it looks really impressive and you go through these big scanners and whatnot, but it doesn't really improve security all that much. I actually had heard a good argument for security theater in that it actually encourages people to take part in the economy. So a security theater actually has actual value to it, even though you know, it's, it doesn't actually do anything. So no more questions? Okay. Okay, so I have just a couple minutes for this uh, Raman spectroscopy, and I wanted to tell you guys about it because it's not something uh, that right I knew. Question? Oh, one more. Uh, I have a slightly off-topic uh, question, but uh, how long will it take till Left 4 Dead for Linux comes out? <laughs> uh, Left 4 Dead on Linux, I think that's in beta already. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, how many of you guys have heard of Raman spectroscopy before? Just a couple. This is a really, really cool technique. And so I, uh, I was at an optics conference for uh, another reason and um, came across a booth. Oh, thank you. Came across a booth uh, where this, uh, this guy was selling uh, Raman spectroscopy kits. And the whole kit was, was about this big. I mean, it was as big of a, a standard brick. And inside it, there was a laser diode and a fiber optic that came out to a probe, and then another fiber optic that came from the probe back into the box. And he was able to just put the probe on something like a pill, like an aspirin pill, medical pill, and determine the chemical composition of the pill just based on the, the light probe touching it. Uh, he said that this technique is used for all kinds of different um, spectroscopy, which is basically you know, figuring out what the spectra is. And uh, you can use it to determine like counterfeit drugs or the uh, quantity of the drug in a certain sample, all kinds of really interesting things. And it's all very compact and relatively cheap. So here's a diagram of how it's set up. You've got your laser, and it doesn't have to be a diode laser, it could be a, I used a helium neon laser for mine. And you pipe all of that laser light into a fiber, and the fiber is aiming straight out into the sample, and then the receiving fiber is also aiming straight out into the sample, and it feeds back into a plain old spectrograph. And all this does is divide up the light into its uh, characteristic wavelengths. So this is, this is, you might figure this is kind of weird. If we're shooting in light at 830 nanometers, it's monochromatic laser light, we should just get a reflection that's 830 nanometers. How does it possibly change color? And this is the trick. So Raman scattering means that you, sh or you shine light into a sample and you actually get different colored light back out. But this is not fluorescence. Uh, don't confuse it with, uh, fluorescence is a, uh, a resonant sort of characteristic where you hit a screen with x-rays and you get green light out. And if you hit the screen with higher energy x-rays, you still get green, red, green light out. In this case, it's a constant shift. So if you shine 830 nanometer light in, you might get 840 nanometer light out. And if you shine 950 in, you might get 960 out. It's a, um, a constant shift. So here's what it looks like for, on an energy diagram. Rayleigh scattering is just plain old scattering, reflection. So if you shine light in, you get light out at the same wavelength. This is you know, going on all the time. The Stokes and the anti-Stokes scattering are the two kinds of Raman scattering where the light actually changes wavelength. And what's interesting is there's an energy change. And so the energy goes into or comes out of the thing that you're imaging with this light. I mean, it's a tiny, tiny amount. There's like one in a billion interactions falls into one of these Stokes or anti-Stokes scattering type things. So if you shine your laser in at 860 nanometer, you're going to get an extremely, extremely dim copy of the beam that's, that's, opted, that's uh, shifted in wavelength out. 
And the, the trick with Raman scattering is that you need a really good optical setup to pick out that very, very faint reflection. So here's the light that's going out of the laser. Uh, in this case, it's a helium neon laser at 632.8 nanometer. And you can see that, I mean, laser light is extremely monochromatic, so there's really nothing anywhere except on the laser line, right on the number. And here's what you, what you get back out. Ah, 20 minutes. Well, I think, <laughs> no, let me keep going for just a bit, because we took questions for the x-ray, and then, uh, yeah. Um, in the middle here, we've got this monster peak, which is the, uh, just the plain old reflection, the Rayleigh scattering of the laser line. So I think, uh, yeah, let's see here. I kind of cheated a little bit. So in the last slide, it was 632.8 nanometer on the center line, and this one, it's actually 785. But like I say, the technique doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't care what wavelength you're using. This, this works, it's just a constant shift, so we can use any wavelength we want, really, within certain limits. Um, but the point is that the, the peak in the middle, the, the, the normal reflected light is literally billions of times brighter than these other peaks out here. So we need to do some optical filtering in order to figure out where the peaks are and actually get some useful information from this. If you start looking into Rayleigh scattering, you'll notice that everyone talks in these wave numbers that have units of centimeters to the minus one. And this is just a convenient way of talking about how far these peaks are from the center point without involving specific wavelengths. So this wave number is just a way of describing what the offset is that's independent of the, of the wavelength. So if we were using helium neon lasers at 632.8, the shift might be delta 20 nanometers, whereas if we were using you know, 950 nanometer illumination light, the delta might be 30 nanometers, but that's just taking into account the longer excitation wavelength. Uh, what's cool is that the, the atomic structure of the thing that we're imaging um, has a big effect on what kind of peaks we get back out. So if we, uh, you know, stimulate over, actually this is, this, is not the, um, this is not the incoming peak, this is actually part of the Rayleigh uh, scattering. Uh, but the point is that the signature changes for each molecule because the shape of the molecule has different vibrational and translational modes. And the different available modes will determine what kind of uh, Rayleigh scattering or uh, what kind of Raman shifts we get out of it. So if the molecule is able to rotate but not translate, maybe we'll get you know, a peak over here. But if it's able to translate and rotate, maybe we get a peak here and a peak here. So what we're really doing is looking at the atomic structure. Here's my setup. This is a helium neon laser here, and it's aiming at this uh, plastic bottle, which is probably high density polyethylene. And I've got an optical fiber that's catching the reflection from the laser here. And the fiber brings the laser light out to here where there's a, a, a knife edge. Or actually, it's a slit, two knife edges. And then there's a diffraction grating here. And the camera is looking at the diffraction grating. So the camera is actually imaging the slit through the diffraction grating. Um, this is, you know, it's, it's basically the same as those little kid's toys that you hold up and see all the rainbowy stuff. This just happens to be a really expensive one on a thick glass substrate. Uh, to image this, I took apart a Canon DSLR camera and removed the infrared filter. Since I'm using laser light at 632.8, some of the shift will actually get all the way into the infrared in, at 800 nanometers or even 900. And so with the infrared filter in place on the camera, I would actually not be able to image uh, the, the spectra in that region. So I took that out. And here's what I got. So it looks kind of cool. I, the first time I got this, I was thinking, oh boy, I've already got some good data. I've got some peaks in here. So on the, um, on the image sensor, we only care about one dimension. The fact that it's a two-dimensional sensor is just kind of you know, icing on the cake, really. Um, but unfortunately, this is not actual data. This is just a um, spurious reflection. <laughs> Um, I, sh I should mention that in the setup, there's also a, um, a laser line filter. So I was saying that you have this problem with the laser line being a billion times brighter than the Raman reflection. How do you get rid of the laser line? You, you have to buy a very, very expensive filter that cuts out just the laser line. And uh, filters are available that have widths of just a few nanometers. So you can buy a custom-made filter from Edmund that will remove just the laser line and leave everything else alone in the spectra. And then when you collect it, you, in theory, you'll still get a little bit of a peak in the middle because even though the filter is good, it's not that good, and you'll still get a bright line in the middle. 
the problem is if you don't use the filter here, the line in the middle will be so bright that it'll just completely wipe out the entire image because it's just, I mean, literally a billion times brighter. Here's a, a chart just showing some approximate shifts for different materials. So you can see that if you've got maybe a, you know, <laughs> a carbon iodine bond and you shine 650 nanometer light into it, uh, you'll get 671 to 679 out. <laughs> so this is pretty cool. You can play detective like this. So if you capture a Raman spectra and you don't know what it is you're looking at, you can use a chart like this and go, oh, I've got a peak at, you know, 671, what's that? Oh, that's carbon iodine. That means the molecule probably has, you know, a carbon iodine bond in it somewhere. Uh, there's kind of a lot of overlap in here, like there's also a carbon bromine bond. How do you know it isn't that? It takes quite a bit of teasing out. It's not good enough to just look at a, a un totally unknown sample and say what it is. But if you're doing analysis and you already have a pretty good idea of what it is you're looking at, uh, Raman spectroscopy can give you the last bit of information. And this chart goes on and on. This, there's like, you know, 50 other things that I, I didn't list here. All right. I think that uh, about wraps it up. So um, I think there's a little bit more time. So if you wanted to give, ask me questions in general or questions about anything I've presented here or... Sample Question. preparation for the Raman spectroscopy? Uh, that's the best part at all. You, you don't have to do anything to your sample. All you do is aim the probe at the material surface. Uh, these kits you mentioned that were sold at these, uh, these meeting, how much were they? Oh, um, the commercial units are about uh, like a few thousand dollars. But there's, I mean, most of the um, cost is in the optics itself. I mean, really all we've got is a laser diode, uh, some fiber optics, some optical parts which are kind of hard to source, but not that bad. I mean, you can get them from Edmund. It's not like, you know, military weird, you know, alien technology. Um, the guy that I was talking to sold his stuff for use on the space shuttle, and he builds ruggedized kits that are, again, only cost NASA even under $10,000. Hi, I've got a couple of questions. Um, <laughs> So the first one is, uh, could you comment on using patterns? I mean, couldn't that be a problem for you? Patterns? Patterns. Oh, patterns. Um, no, I don't, uh, why would it be a problem for me? No, I, so part of the reason that I like doing this stuff in my free time is because I don't have to worry about profitability or patents or whether my customer is going to like the product. When I was doing my MRI business, this was a good escape for me because I didn't have to worry about any of those things. All this stuff is purely hobby, exploratory type stuff. So you say that uh, using patterns is it's, it's okay if you're just doing it uh, like a private person. But oh, as sure. soon as, as would, I mean, uh, what if you would publish your uh, like plans and stuff? And would it be okay that there is a pattern in use? Yeah, as far as I know, the only, the only way that you would violate a patent is if you were selling a competing product. So just saying what's in a patent is totally okay, and, and even building something that's in a patent is totally okay, as long as you aren't competing with the patent holder. In fact, it's, it's even okay as long as the patent holder doesn't want to sue you, so you can even violate a patent if you want. <laughs> and as long as the person doesn't sue you, or even if he does sue you, and you have a bigger lawyer staff, that's okay too, so. Uh, and the other thing is, if you want to file a patent, you have to publish some parts of your work which is one of the reasons why, for example, universities don't always want to have a patent on the things they create because they would have to publish things and, and other companies as well. So and that's the thing, because if you would want to do like open hardware, you would publish things. You would publish like plans and, and schematics and... But, but so. then you have prior art. So if you, if you are the first one, it's prior art. So there, another one could, could not file a patent on your, on your work. But if you use a patent in your prior art, uh... then of course okay, it was just, uh, I was just curious about it. Is there any questions more? Because I would just uh, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go on. I don't see any other. The second would be, um, can you comment on the danger, please? Like, uh, if I see that, uh, I would say, oh, cool, let's, uh, like, uh, scan my hand. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, the uh, backscatter is uh, surprisingly strong. So I used Mighty Ohm's Geiger counter, which has like a, 
an SM20 Geiger tube, which is a common one off eBay or something. And the, <clears throat> the Geiger tube is only about three inches long by, you know, sorry, a centimeter in diameter. And um, if you're just holding it in a room with the X-ray beam running pointed away from you, the Geiger counter will almost be pegged, <laughs> solid, a solid string of beeping. And so there's a lot of X-ray photons that hit the objects and are, are backscattered off, which is why the imaging technique is so uh, effective. And um, even that, even standing in the wash of the backscatter is several orders of magnitude less intense than being in the beam. Um, so, you know, I, I think being exposed to the backscatter is kind of okay. When I was doing the CT stuff, I set that up on a stepper motor and walked away because I didn't want to be in the room for 45 minutes with it. Um, the dose that you would get from about a few five to 10 second exposures while doing the, the other stuff is, again, 100 times less intense than even like a dental x-ray. Well, is it on? Yeah. Okay, one important thing to note about using Geiger counters and x-rays is uh, if you have a, a longer pulse of x-rays, if you have it on for a couple of seconds, that's kind of fine to use. Um, but the thing is that in a short pulse of x-rays, like in a conventional x-ray exposure for a hand or something, uh, which is like 60 nanoseconds, for example, the Geiger tube will not notice any radiation at all. So you could have a few pulses after one another. The Geiger counter would show a zero reading while you're exposed to a few millisieverts. So uh, when you're handling x-ray equipment, uh, you should use a very sensitive, like, scintillation counter or something, and, uh, or otherwise you'll have a false sense of security. So that's important, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's definitely good advice. I have heard that they're, they're inaccurate for counting x-rays in general, especially low energy x-rays. So under 50 kV, mm, not easily counted and still, I guess, dangerous enough. One, inter one interesting thing is that uh, black and white TVs were not lead shielded because they only ran at about 10 kilovolts. <clears throat> and the 10 kilovolts x-rays are not even strong enough to get outside the glass. But color TVs are lead shielded because they ran at about 30 kV, which was strong enough to generate x-rays that would penetrate through the glass. Dann mach ich mal weiter. Um, the first uh, thought I came up with when I saw your like your 3D uh, inner, uh, it's, it's uh, amazing. A chicken? Yeah, what, uh, now you have to couple it to a 3D uh, printer or something? <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, did you think about that? that you, could, you could scan like, a, um, um, well, hidden things yeah. in, into like a treasure uh, and then print it out? That would be pretty interesting. You actually could couple this to a 3D printer, especially with like two different materials. You could actually print the skeletal structure in addition to the flesh at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the next step. I'm not sure what you would do with a 3D printed chicken, but... <laughs> hey, are there any more questions? Yes. Uh, um, what are your next plans on the Ramsey uh, scattering? Uh, Raman scattering. Oh, the Raman scattering? Um, Getting it to work would be good. Like, I'm not, I'm not even quite to the point where I've collected data that's actually usable. Um, too many fun projects, and, uh, and now I've got a real job, so I actually have to worry about that. I think the next major project for me will be doing a linear accelerator, which that one I, I expect will be even more difficult than the scanning electron microscope, and it's uh, certainly more dangerous. If you guys want some really spooky bedtime reading, read up on the uh, Thyrotron. Uh, or the Theratron disasters, which are uh, a linear accelerator that accidentally overdosed patients. And um, even just one or two blasts from that thing are enough to uh, seriously ruin your day or even your life. So that's... Uh, <laughs> Hello. Uh, I do have a question concerning Raman spectros uh, spectroscopy. Huh? And um, uh, what was it? Um, the problem, I think, is with the sensors, you have not a linear um, intensity because uh, sensors are, have the higher um, uh, recip um, Yeah, if you, more sensitive in the infrared region than the visible region. It quite, it quite possibly could be. Um, the nice thing is that once, it go, once the image goes through the diffraction grating, the location will be correct. The intensity might not be quite so correct, but at least the location of the, of the, of the peak should be okay. Um, in this image, it's not correct because the spacing is so regular. I, I just, there's a spurious reflection or something in there. 
but you're right, the, the, sensitivity of the, the sensitivity of the sensor should be fairly flat for a good reading. All right, well, thanks very much. Hey, so in like 10 minutes, we have the next presentation uh, again on CERN. By